Welcome to Keep the Game Beautiful podcast. Each week, I highlight incredible people who are doing amazing things in soccer, the beautiful game. I'm Anna Turi, your host. Thank you for listening. Today, Ian Barker and I talk a little bit about when he first started his coaching career and when he started coaching coaches. We talk about any advice he'd have for younger coaches just starting out. And we talk a little bit about the women's game and how many women are in classes. And I think that's really important to discuss a little bit. At the end of today's podcast, he gave me some great advice. And I think that's really, really going to help the flow. And it made me just a little more confident and sure of what I was doing. He's been very supportive of me, and I really enjoyed today's episode. So I hope you enjoy it too. Today's guest is Ian Barker. I met Ian at the most recent coaching class I attended. Right away, he came up to me and said he loved what I'm doing. I am a proud member of United Soccer Coaches, and I've I've been a part for almost a year. I've earned four diplomas already, and I will keep learning. So Ian coached at McAllister College, and before that at the University of Wisconsin, where he spent eight years. He was the assistant coach at University of Wisconsin during four NCAA tournament appearances out of the eight he coached there. From 1997 to 2007, He was the Director of Coaching and Player Development for the Minnesota Youth Soccer Association. He is now the United Soccer Coaches Director of Coaching and Education, and he has been in this role since 2012. Thank you for joining me today, Ian. Are there any other stories or background information that you would like to share? Uh, Well, thank you very much for having me, first of all. And it was a pleasure to work with you a couple of, uh, maybe about a month ago here in Kansas City. My colleague, Jeff Van Dusen, who told me about your work, And so I checked it out before I met you and and got kind of inspired to see if I could uh, invite myself onto your podcast. Um, My, my, uh, you you did a great job with the background, a lot of college, and then also a lot of um, club and coach development. And that's my current role right now is more in the coaching education space. But it's difficult to be an authentic educator of coaches if you're not doing some coaching yourself. So the way I get to do coaching outside of clinics and conventions and presentations is I work a lot in the Olympic development program on the boys side. So I do get to coach and manage players and teams, which helps me when I'm sharing my ideas with other coaches. So coach education, but um, with application for sure. So on this podcast, I always start with the same three questions. First, what does the beautiful game mean to you? Um, for me, it's, it's, uh, it is my life because uh, growing up in Great Britain, you sort of get involved when you're four or five. Um, your family, certainly the male members of your family have participated, and it's in every newspaper, every TV, every broadcast. So for me, uh, <laughs> maybe this is a little bizarre, but it's like a cocoon. I mean, I'm in it all the time, and I'm very fortunate because Um, Not only is it my life's passion as a fan, um, it's also my life's work for a career. So I'm very fortunate to be, to make soccer my life. What are actions or things you do to keep the game beautiful? The thing that I try to do is um, treat everybody that's involved with the game, parents, administrators, referees, coaches, to the best of my ability with respect because um, we're actually quite a small community and I think we need to respect everybody within it. So I'm uh, very happy talking with a grassroots mum and dad coach who's maybe just coaching for the very first time. I'm very happy talking to young players, um, trying to be decent and nice to referees and administrators. So I think my, my important message or my, what I've learned over time is – You want to have good skills at your coaching and things, but the number one thing is treat all people with respect. And then I think if you do that, that's the best way to grow the game. How do you encourage others to keep the game beautiful? Um, Great question. Um, I like people to, I try to help people with keep a perspective. So when you're younger as a coach, you really take the highs of winning and the lows of losing very, very seriously and personally. 
And the more you coach, uh, the more wins you have, but inevitably the more losses you have. So you can't always live on those two extremes. So I try to encourage coaches to keep a healthy perspective because if the coach has a good perspective, then typically the players and the parents can benefit from that. And then I really encourage coaches to be experts uh, in their environment. So the coach might not think he or she is an expert, but they're the ones that know best the field they train on, the players they have, the equipment they have. So when we do coaching education, even if it's, um, you know, mum and dad, first time coaches, I encourage them to be experts um, and be proud of their contribution and their knowledge. How, do you, how did you decide you wanted to start coaching coaches? Um, that's, uh, that's uh, again, another very good question. So you want to be a player. And then at some point you realize that maybe you have to become a coach because your legs don't move so well anymore. And um, if you're an amateur player, uh, maybe you can get paid to coach. So the transition from player to coach was really big. Um, but some, co- some players don't make good coaches. And many good, good coaches aren't particularly good about sharing their knowledge with other coaches. Um, some people think that I have a, a skill in sharing my ideas with other adults and other coaches, or young adults as well. So um, I, I sort of fell into it by design. Somebody said to me, would I coach a US soccer local license? And I did that and I enjoyed it and the people on the course seemed to like it. And so I went out and developed my skills as an educator. I do have a postgraduate degree in teaching, uh, sort of teaching high school. Um, So I I had some training in how to educate, but of course, educating adults, uh, especially in the sport of soccer is a little bit different than teaching English and drama in high school. Why do you find that many coaches start coaching in the first place? Uh, I actually think that a lot of coaches, the vast majority of coaches, um, and we probably don't talk about the majority of coaches enough, um, get involved because their children are involved. So, you know, if you looked at it as a, an iceberg um, with a lot, of, a lot of the activity below the waterline, or you looked at it as a pyramid, certainly we'll talk about Um, the head coach of the national teams of America or the coaches in NWSL and MLS. But when we talk about most coaches, we're talking about mums and dads coaching grassroots recreational programs in small towns and and communities all across America. And I think the main reason they get involved is because their children are involved. Um, The next level of coach gets involved because he or she was a player and they want to stay around the game. After that, Some people realize that you can get paid for it, part-time, full-time. And then, of course, there's a few of us that it's our our full-time career. And so we've gone from player to coach to coach educator or player to coach. So I think it's it's a lot of different entry points. But by far and away, most people do it just because they want to do the best they can for their own children. What advice would you give to a young coach just starting out? Be honest with what you do and don't know. Think critically about the players that you have. So um, just because you were a really good male college player doesn't mean that you're necessarily thinking the same way a group of U11, U12 boys or girls think. So I think a young coach, um, be very self-aware, know what your strengths and weaknesses are. And then very importantly, Look at all the different types of players and uh, you can coach different genders, different skill levels, uh, high school different than club, club different than academy. Um, And to the best of your ability, try to match up yourself with the athletes that you get to coach. Um, But don't make it all about you. Your job is to facilitate the experience of the athlete. How has online coaching education impacted the work that you do now? Quite a lot. We find that coaches, like everybody, have a little bit less time. And maybe now in this particular um, time, in March of 2020, uh, they have a little bit less money too. So uh, a lot of coaches tell us they don't want to give up lots of time and lots of money for their education. So one of the ways you can solve that is uh, e-learning because 
Uh, once you've built the course, you don't have a lot of expenses of traveling instructors. And then um, the coaches, of course, can take the education when they want it. Sometimes you deliver live webinars, but very often you're, you're creating it and recording it. So we find that lots and lots of people really like this. I think all coaches that you talk to would say that you can never replace the experience of being on the field, in person, with a ball, with players, with other coaches. I don't think anybody thinks that that isn't, you know, the ideal situation. And many coaches, that's what they want. So we still provide that. Um, and we provide it in very big numbers, as does U.S. soccer. But we're opening up now opportunities for many, many more coaches to get educated because they don't have a lot of time or money or because they are more comfortable. And certainly a lot of our younger coaches living in the electronic or the virtual world. So we found that we actually are doing more coach education. We're still doing the traditional in person, but it's really expanded the reach and the messaging. And it's allowing all coaches to feel like there is some um, material out there for them, even if they're a grassroots coach, they didn't think there was. They didn't think they would go to a course. They don't have to anymore because they can sit and enjoy the information from their computer. How can people bring a United Soccer Coaches class to their area? Well, the the best way is to contact me and Allison at unitedsoccercoaches.org. Um, our emails are my email is i barker at unitedsoccercoaches.org. And what we really need is we need the person that would like the, the course at their community to have some people ready to go. So we will work out the most affordable way to bring the course in person to a club or a community if they ask us. But we aren't really able to, so let's say a small community like Osceola, Iowa. I'm not going to go to Osceola and say, here's a course, everybody come to it. I kind of need to wait for somebody in Osceola to say, we've got a nice little club. We've got about 20 coaches. We think 10 of them will come if we put on a course for two or three hours. That is the magic of it. So whether it's an individual coach online or it's the leader in a community, um, if they've got the enthusiasm, we've got the energy and hopefully the content to meet their enthusiasm and, uh, and energy too. How have you seen the amount of women in a class change throughout the year? Ha, huh, that's, a, that's a really good question. So let me, let me help with some, some ideas. We know that, that probably there are slightly more girls or women playing soccer in America than boys or men. So we've got a, just a little bit, let's say it's 49, 51, 51% 51 women. There are virtually no women coaching boys or men but there are lots and lots and lots of men coaching female athletes. So in our membership, we think we've got about 20% female coaches. And when I look around, that sort of seems to be a reasonable number. For every four coaches, five coaches I run into, four are guys and one is a female. So on our courses, that tends to be the number two. So somewhere in the region of 20%. You and I did a grassroots urban diploma and we also did it with a special topics on how to coach female athletes. And so we had about a 50-50 split, maybe even mm -hmm. slightly more. But that is very unusual. And that was because the content was particularly girl and women focused. So it's not fantastic. And I think there are some really good reasons for that. I think it's tough when you're a minority to come into that environment. And if there's a belief that you have to play and keep up, and maybe you're not so sure about your playing ability or you run into some people you think are more athletic, that can be challenging. So some colleagues of mine in Massachusetts recently did an all girls course or all female course. So they had college athletes and uh, uh, adult women coaches and Kristen Lilly made an, um, an appearance. So that was really good. And we had 37 uh, women take that course, which is the, the most women we've ever had in a single course. So it, it's getting better. But I think we as, as male coaches need to make the environments more friendly. And I think more women coaches need to um, talk to other women and encourage them to get involved. So I, I don't think it's, um, there's a single solution to doing better, but um, we're getting there slowly, for sure. Do you think in the next few years you'll see more, women, more and more women in classes? Yes, I believe so. I think it will be amazing if... Um, 
we have a female vice president of the United States of America. Um, I think if that happens, um, it'll change the women's opportunities in society across the board a lot. We have amazing female coaches in the college game, particularly in this country, not so many in the NWSL, which is, I think, really unfortunate. And then we have somebody like Jill Ellis who won a couple of World Cups. So I think we've got tons of excellent role models. And I think we have excellent female role models in coaching at the high school level and also at the grassroots level. We need to see more female coaches getting jobs directing youth clubs and working in state associations. But I think the doors are open and I think more and more women are feeling like it's safe and encouraging to walk through those doors. I think maybe before people try to open doors but didn't really think about whether the person would be um, excited to walk through them. So now I think we've opened the door and we've extended the invitation a little bit better than we have before. And so I think it's, um, I think we're, again, I think we're in a positive situation, but a long, long way from being finished with this. How does someone become a trainer for United Soccer Coaches? So almost all of the coaches that do teaching for me um, are coaches or teachers or professional people in their normal, uh, normal life. Um, what I like to have is if a person is going to teach a course, a four-hour grassroots course or a week-long advanced course, I, I expect them to have the highest licenses or diplomas of United Soccer Coaches in U.S. and or U.S. Soccer. So I don't think it's very uh, fair to send an instructor in uh, to teach people if he or she hasn't already gone through all those courses themselves. Um, so I expect the coach to have the, the qualifications. That doesn't mean they're necessarily a good teacher. So the next thing we do is if we have a course near them and they can give us some of their time for free, they come in and they work with the instructor, the, the experienced and qualified instructor to see if they like it. Maybe they teach a couple of hours of the class. And then if they come back to me after that and say, you know what, I think I could do this. I, we give them all the materials. We give them uh, mainly online training, distance training. And then as soon as the course gets popped up, we'll send them in to teach it. The very best way to become a teacher for me or for my organization is to um, set up a course and then we'll bring the instructors to that venue and then that instructor gets trained on the job. But there are no, we don't have a very snobby attitude that says you've got to be a certain age or a certain gender. We do expect you to have some qualifications, but it's more your enthusiasm and interest and then your ability to share your knowledge with other people and be respectful. And that's why I use anywhere from two to maybe 500 instructors a year across the country. I know you've posted some scenarios on Twitter recently. Mm -hmm. How important is it to teach the cognitive part of the game to athletes and coaches? Yeah, it's, um, it's two different challenges. So coaches get very interested in tactics and X's and O's and theory and then they get interested in other things like psychology and man management and these kinds of things. And sometimes I think the coaches forget that what a lot of players want is individual help with skill development and physical development. And then they want a safe um, environment where they can be successful. So I think sometimes our coaches get too theoretical or cerebral or um, too much into the, the cognitive. And then sometimes our players go out into the game thinking that their ability to run fast and kick it hard is enough. So what I like to do with my ODP players is there's, there's nothing they like more than playing in the games. So we have a game. We probably have two or three trainings for each game we play. And then we probably have three to six meetings to support those trainings. So it might be three to six little meetings, three or four trainings, and then again, that's sort of how much time we have. So I will use things like uh, the Kahoot, like a little online quiz with them and put up some scenarios and say, if this was you and you had the ball here, what decision would you make? So it just gets them thinking about a, a simple tactic. We might do individual conversations. So you're a striker, you have probably uh, less, uh, you get less of the ball 
you have to make quicker decisions, you probably have less support than if you're a central defender and a goalkeeper. So we might start to talk to players differently about their different roles. And then we might talk to them individually, but then we might bring them in and put the two strikers together or put the attacking midfielder with the striker and say, how are you two going to work together? So there's many, many different ways to engage the coaches and to engage the athletes. Um, But more and more, um, based on our ability to have contact time, we try to tailor thing more, tailor things more for individuals or specific responsibilities. And, and certainly the coaches have a different set of responsibilities than the players. So that's the very first place I'd start. Do you know why more coaches don't spend time on decision making? Um, it's a, again, a really interesting question. So if the coach, I, I would support, if a coach doesn't feel confident in what they're teaching, uh, then they shouldn't teach it. So practice uh, makes permanent. It doesn't make perfect. If the coach uh, is, is a nice person and a solid person and the players like him or her, then the players will try to work for the coach. Um, and so, sometimes the coach is putting information, technical skills, tactics that they don't really understand, but the kids go and try and do it for them anyway, and then we get bad habits. Um, so I like it if the coach says, you know what, we're just going to work on keep away games and technique and this kind of thing. Um, if the coach feels like he or she has a little bit of knowledge, then that is the time to share it. But, you know, talking to an eight-year-old player about 11 v 11, first of all, they don't play 11 v 11. And secondly, it doesn't make any sense. So we should be talking to an eight-year-old about having fun and moving and helping their teammate and competing against their opponent. By the time we get to 11 v 11, 11 v 11, maybe older youth ages and high school ages, then hopefully the coaches do feel a little bit better about talking about formations and systems and things like that. How can a coach develop a relationship with their players? Um, It's different, obviously, at every level, because if you're a professional uh, coach, you have a, you, hopefully you have a good relationship with the athletes, but at the end of the day, you have to cut them and fire them if they're not performing and that's money. So professional level is one. College level is, is a different level because um, the kids, the players are students, so they have to go to school. They have boyfriends, girlfriends. They have to study. They have to eat. They have to do laundry. And you have them for four years. So you kind of make a commitment to that, that athlete for four years. So that's a different relationship. And then, of course, in the youth environment, um, you maybe see the players twice a week. You have a game. And most of the time, they're with their mums and dads or uh, family. So every, every situation is different. But I think for most of the coaches that probably listen to your show, um, they're dealing in the youth environment. So what I would say is this. I would say is make sure that all of your connection with your athletes is done in a way that the parents and the guardians are included. So be very careful about, um, you know, direct messaging an athlete or emailing that athlete and not being, not being, uh, not having a parent or somebody else involved. So I don't like to see coaches having very private one-on-one conversations with their athletes um, at the youth level. Um, But I, we use a little idea that I think might help some of your coaches. We talk about, you've got to express that you care about athletes. So um, how was your day at school today? Um, I know you got an injury last week. Um, uh, I know that um, you and your family just came back from a vacation. So it doesn't have to be about soccer, but you have to express that you have an interest in the, the athlete. That's the number one thing. So that's care. Competence is that you have to, make them feel like they have a value to the program. So I thought your crossing today was very good. Um, I really see an improvement in your passing and shooting. I think if you continue to develop like this, you can go from the bench to starting. So that's what we call competence. And then the third one is choice. So um, that might be sometimes in training, how much effort are you going to put in today? You know, how are you feeling? What do you think is the right amount of effort today? Uh, sometimes asking the players what things they'd like to work on. So you ask the group. Um, So choice and empowerment. So that makes it a nice three C's. 
show me that you care, show me that I have competence, that I have some value, and give me some choice about my participation. And if a coach can hit those three C's, they'll, they will make a connection with their players. There has been a lot of work on the human side of coaching. I know I've talked to Shay Haddo of Alpha Girl Soccer and Molly Grisham. Both of them do a really good job about talking about the importance of identity, confidence, and leadership. Is this, is this work something that United Soccer coaches will grow? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and certainly the, probably the number one space for that is the convention where uh, on an annual basis we have about um, – probably about 11,000 people, but about 7,000 for the coaching alone come together in a location to be in person and listen to lectures and presentations. Um, the next place we would do it is in the online platform and then in our print materials. And then we're starting to get more into these things on the courses because that's what coaches want to talk about. What I think is important um, and might be interesting for people to think about is, is it our responsibility to develop soccer? And while we're coaching soccer, um, we use soccer as an avenue to get into these topics. Or are we interested in these topics and we're just going to find a delivery mechanism and it's sport? So from my point of view, soccer is what brought me to the space. And now I'm developing a lot more of these um, hu hu humanistic ideas. If I was a humanist, uh, I might come to it and say, okay, how do I get my message across? Let's use literature or let's use drama or maybe uh, faith-based or sports. So I think we all need to know what our skill set is and our motivation. I don't think the two things are incompatible and I don't think one comes before the other, but I do think we need to understand um, our motivation. And what I can tell you is, you know, we say make it fun for kids. Well, if I bring, you know, Girl Scout cookies and balloons and a Frisbee and a puppy to soccer training for a 10-year-old, the players will have fun, but it's nothing to do with soccer. So in my case, everything that we do, soccer is still at the root of it, but it's not just about wins and losses. It is about developing character and, um, you know, uh, personal good, good development and, and uh, goodwill. When the United Soccer Coaches Twitter asked about what coaches need right now, there were several that mentioned mental health. Is this something else that you might be working on? And do you have any initial ideas? Absolutely. So um, this is a, a pretty mature topic, obviously. Um, but we recently put out some information about um, diversity. So um, LGBT coaches, athletes, uh, making the space welcome to everybody. So if an athlete or a coach is struggling with some, some issues that relate to their gender or their ethnicity or their sexual orientation, so we've provided some resources there. Because of some of the really tough stories out of the college sports about abuse of athletes, physical abuse, uh, we partnered with an organization here in Kansas City called MOXA, which is the Metropolitan Organization for Countering Sexual Assault. So we talked to coaches about how they can recognize abuse, prevent abuse of adults as well as of uh, younger athletes. One of my good friends, a college coach in Minnesota, recently reached out to me and said that he had been dealing with depression and one of his dealing mechanisms was, was abusing alcohol. And so I'm working with our college coaches group to pull up some resources for how coaches can, can help there. If you Google athletics and alcohol it will talk a lot about athletes abusing alcohol but it doesn't talk a lot about coaches and sometimes being a coach can be very lonely so I think all the time we're talking more about um, what it means to be a coach and it's not just about x's and o's and being on the field. So I know when I first met you it was at the keeping women and girls in the game like little in class mm -hmm. what why do you think this is important for coaches to attend? I think uh, because we, we haven't done enough as a, as a community to get more women coaches in the space. So we want to create environments where more women coaches can feel like this is something they can get involved with, which was great when you and I were together because we had some co recent college graduates, some women playing in the 
WPSL. So they were still playing, but they were starting to see that coaching could be a, a career or a hobby. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. And then I think we need to uh, continually discuss, especially with male coaches, how it might be different when you're coaching a group of young females as opposed to a bunch of young, a uh, coach and group of young males. So if the age group is 13, 14, um, there's a lot going on in those teenage years, which are different for boys than girls, perhaps. And so what happens is a lot of times a coach likes to coach boys, uh, but he needs some more money. So he takes up a girls team and he coaches them the same way. So I really like having the discussion about the challenges, the differences, the benefits, the joys of coaching female athletes as opposed to male athletes. And I do think there are differences. And I do think those conversations are very, very important. And more often than not, we have poorly trained male coaches trying to coach females when they're not equipped to do it and they've never done it before, but they just wanted to go there for a paycheck, perhaps. What do you wish you knew before going into your first collegiate coaching job? I wish I had thought more about, and I think this is a kind of an answer that I, I maybe gave earlier. I wish I'd thought more about what, it, what the athletes were thinking. So I was at Wisconsin. All I did all day was think about coaching and coaching the Wisconsin team, maybe two games a week and a training every day except for Sundays. Um, and I never thought about the fact that the boys lived in the dorms. They had, you know, they had romantic lives. They certainly had very, very important academic lives. A couple of my guys were chemical engineers and traveled abroad and all kinds of things. They had to feed themselves. They had to do laundry. They had to check in with their parents occasionally. They wanted to go out and have a social life. So soccer was, during the season, a very important part of their life because they were D1 and they were scholarship. But even during the season, it was probably only 35%, 40% of their life, let's say. And in the spring, a lot less. But it was 100% for me. And so I expected too much of them. I wanted too much. I took it too seriously or I took it too personally, the losses and the wins, whereas the boys would get over them a little bit quicker. So I wish I had thought more about my product and less about myself when I was a younger college coach. When you started thinking less about yourself, did you see a change in the way the players responded? 100%, yeah. So if you've, if you've coached for a long time and, it's, and you haven't moved from job to job, uh, just so you, just, you, know, you keep failing and, uh, and making people unhappy, so you just move to the next place. But one of the things that you start to do is, is think about the relationships and the human side much more than the wins and losses. So my guys at McAllister now, um, a lot of those guys are in their mid-30s. And I have um, lots of wedding invitations, lots of really nice notes from them back and forth. And we don't talk about wins and losses first. We talk about funny things that happened, and we do talk about um, trophies and championships. But it's a lot more about what the four years together has done for us as, as adults and those connections than it is about the wins and losses. And so as you mature as a coach, I don't think you can get, you can, there's a, you can get better with the X's and O's and the trainings and game management. Uh, that's great. But where you can make the biggest strides as a coach is how you interact with people. That's the, that is the, the one where I really think there's no ceiling on to how far you can go in the human interaction. So I know you've been able to travel all over the world and meet some amazing people, coaches and players. What are some of the most memorable moments when coaching coaches? When coaching coaches, huh? Okay, this is the number one most memorable thing in coaching coaches. It's a true story and it's one I've told a few times. I was in uh, Uganda uh, and Africa and I was coaching a group of coaches and a small group of the coaches were deaf. Um, because they had contracted malaria and the medication to, to keep them alive um, does often it will ruin their hearing. So I had worked with these group of deaf coaches, uh, hearing impaired coaches for a week. And I had an interpreter and we learned, I learned some new tricks about how to coach and it was great. And on the last day, we were going to take the coaches to watch Uganda play Kenya. So that's a big rivalry. And we were getting changed. So I was in the locker room and I was with all the deaf coaches. 
and um, my interpreter uh, went to the bathroom and all of a sudden I was with all the coaches and they were all signing and I couldn't understand them. So I went from being the, the, the healthy one and the leader to being the disabled one, if you will, or the disadvantaged one, because I became deaf because I couldn't, I couldn't sign. And so all of a sudden, I realized that, you know, I was the head of the class and I was the experienced instructor, which I was, and that was reasonable. But at the end of the day, I could learn a lot and I could be on the other side of the classroom just as easily. So that was one of the most amazing experiences. And it happened pretty much exactly as I explained it to you. It's, I'm not making this one up. This one, I really just suddenly realized, oh, crikey, I'm deaf. And all these people are communicating. And if, they're, if they want to take advantage of me, they can. And um, fortunately, I, I liked them and trust them and felt safe. And it was great. But that was an amazing experience. So we've made it to our final question. Mm-hmm. What do you hope people remember about your impact to soccer and the world? I, I would like the coaches and the players that I've worked with who are a lot younger than me or a little bit younger than me to continue the efforts and the good things that I did and improve upon them. Um, And and then the things that I didn't do so well, uh, make sure they don't happen again. So I would like my legacy, if, if that's something to your question, to be passed on by the improved performances of the people I've worked with that come after me. Um, I don't really want to receive a clock um, or a, um, a big farewell party because that doesn't seem um, doesn't seem like anything I'm really interested in. the The biggest achievement outside of getting paid, and I do need to have a job, um, would be that the game after I'm gone is better because of the contributions I made, and that wouldn't be directly because of a course I wrote or a game I won. It would be because the coaches and players that I work with are a better version of me. So I don't know if that completely makes sense, but it's much more in the legacy of the the connections you made than in wins and losses. So I know Ian and Vince are doing a little series, webinar series that you can go check out. I know Ian will probably have it on his Twitter at iBarkerSoccer. So I hope you can check that out and maybe stay a little busy. They do it two times a day. So that will give you at least something to do. As always, stay safe and healthy. And until I see you next time, remember to keep the game beautiful.